Welcome to the Q&A part for the first session of our lecture, International Political Economy. Okay, that was my first question and answer session. Again, it has become way too long, way longer than I would have expected. I, I'm still going to upload it pretty much like this, but I have to try to make it shorter in the future. My excuse is that this was a double session, but I really don't want to go more than 30 minutes in the future for my sake, for your sake. I'm overwhelmed by all of your questions, on the one hand by the sheer amount of them, there are 80 or 90 students in the seminar, and if each of you sends me two or three questions, there are a lot of them. Secondly, I'm also overwhelmed and impressed by the quality of the questions because they are really, really good questions, and I would really love to answer as many of them as possible, however, the time is limited, and I will have to select some. So the way I try to do this is as follows. First, I chose four areas from the reading and the lecture on which many of you asked questions. So I explain a little bit more there and hopefully um, reply to some of your questions thereby. And after I did this for four areas, I will then come at the end to some kind of speed Q&A where I just take individual questions that I have randomly selected from all of your questions and try to give direct answers to them. Let's come to the first area of questions regarding the diagrams on the economic shock of the COVID-19 pandemic. First we have these two diagrams right here. The first again it's from the WTO regarding the effect on international trade. The second is from the IMF regarding the effect on um, the global GDP. And some of you asked, okay, first, how do they have these estimates for the future? And secondly, uh, how come there are different estimates? So there's always a more optimistic and a more pessimistic course. The answer is one thing economists are really great at is creating models. And some of the models really work like, like computer programs or computer algorithms. And then you just have to, have to um, enter certain um, certain variables into the computer program and then it will kind of tell you what will probably happen. One example is if you say I have reasons to believe that the demand in cars will decrease by 10% in the next um, five months or so, meaning that 10% 10 10 fewer people will um, want to buy cars then. And then you enter this in the program, then the program might tell you what will happen then. And for example, you kind of can calculate if there are 10% fewer cars to be sold, then car companies first have a problem selling their stuff, then they will make um, less profits. Um, they might also have to lay off some of their employees who will then be unemployed and have um, less money so that they will in turn be able to spend fewer money on other stuff, let's say on, on coffee or on, on internet streaming or whatever people spend their money on. And then there's also the fact that if the car manufacturers produce fewer cars, they will also need um, less steel, need less energy and so on and so on. So maybe steel prices will fall, which will also have effects. And as you see from what I just said, it becomes real complicated real quick. So you need to have good models to make any kind of predictions here. And those big organizations, they do have pretty good models. However, right now they don't really know what they should put in there because we don't know the facts of the, of the crisis from, medical, from, from a medical perspective alone. So we don't know, will um, shops and, and some factories and schools and so on have to be closed for the next three months or for the next two years? And this will obviously have very, very different effects. So they have to play through different scenarios where in one scenario, it might be very optimistically calculated that we will just operate normally in two or three months. I don't believe this but maybe they entered this into the algorithm. And there's also maybe a very pessimistic perspective where the crisis will hit globally, will hit every country, and every country will have to take drastic measures for 
two years time until we finally have a vaccine and we don't know when we have a vaccine it might be this fall as very optimistic people think it might be never as very pessimistic people think and most likely it will be somewhere in between maybe sometime next year so they don't really know what to put in there so what they then always do is they make different calculation and they make one calculation where they put optimistic numbers and one where they put in um, pessimistic numbers and these you see as different lines over there and there's also something that you can see about the way crises play out particularly in the in the left diagram from the WTO they first see in the middle this this dent um, for the Great Recession in 2009 and one thing that you see there is that the international trade was on a constant course of, of growing over the last um, of the preceding seven years or so and then you see the gray dotted line it's how the international trade would have grown if um, the same growth rates would have continued but they didn't because the crisis hit and then there was this dent and then there are different forms of crisis economists call them v-shaped u-shaped or l-shaped crisis and in a v-shaped crisis the best case scenario is you have production and trade declining just for a couple of months and then there will be a rebound and the rebound will also come with the effect where you catch up all the production and all the trade that you haven't done so far so if you are very optimistic and you believe that this crisis will only last a couple of months and the state will give everyone money so maybe in the year at the end there will be as many cars sold as would have been otherwise it's only right now that people don't buy cars because car shops are maybe closed maybe also because they are not certain right now but in three months when they see well my salary is back to normal then they might just resume the old activities and catch up all consumptions they they discontinued in this short period and then you can also ask well will they also be able to eat all the restaurant meals they haven't ate, eaten in the last couple of two or three months it's more uh, unlikely there but in a best case scenario the crisis will only be a short time effect and afterwards we will be there where we would have been without a crisis and as you see in the middle of the diagram it didn't happen in 2008 because it, the economy never bounced back fully it resumed to a new growth curve but not to the old one and if you look to the right of the diagram the green line which is the optimistic calculation this would say well we come back almost at the same point where we would have been without the crisis and then this was just like all just like a bad dream for a couple of months and then everything was at as, would have, as it would have been the red line is less optimistic because there you don't only have this dent you don't have a full recovery but only a partial recovery and then you continue growth on a slower course and if you have depression after the crisis you don't have growth at all basically and depending on the on the parameters that you put into um, your models you will have different estimations and so the best um, they can do predictively here is give some good and some uh, bad or some posi positive and some um, negative estimates and one more thing two of you um, saw something in the first diagram that's very interesting that's actually there namely that there was no growth in international trade in 2019 also so it's not only that once the pandemic hit international growth stopped to grow it stopped growing beforehand and that's partially due to the trade war between uh, the United States and China and partially also um, between the United States and Europe and but it's also hinting to some wider crisis dynamics within capitalism because some of you also asked what about the general cyclical crisis dynamics in capitalism um, there are crises every five or ten years or so um, when growth will plummet and then it will resume and so someone asked well isn't this wouldn't this have happened anyway and there's it's very likely that um, right now we would see some type of economic crisis anyway many uh, econ economists predicted this in the last couple of years that around 
this year, next year, last year, we'll have some form of crisis, but it, of course it's much steeper and much harsher and maybe quicker than it um, would have been um, otherwise. And one general remark, if you don't understand everything that I explain right here, that's absolutely fine because I explain stuff that's gonna be in later sessions also and some of this stuff is really counterintuitive um, and so don't be worried if you don't if it, not everything makes sense to you right now and be assured if you listen to all the lectures and read all the literature a lot of the stuff will make sense um, in three or four months from now because many of this kind of thinking is something you have to get used to think this way even though it's not what you would intuitively um, think. Another diagram about many of you asked questions, this one about the impact on commodity prices. In general, you can ask yourself, how is the price of a commodity determined? First, you can assume that it will have something to do with the price of production. So typically, in a market economy, nobody would sell something for less money than it cost them to produce it. So if producing a barrel of oil costs, cost, I don't know, $100, you would guess that it cost in the end in the market somewhat more than $100. But this is only general baseline, then there's the, the dynamics of demand and supply. So if more people want something, the price will, will go higher. And if um, more is um, on the market, the supply is higher, then the price will sink. So what's happening in the pandemic? First, so where is oil going to be used? First, it's used in, in transportation, so in cars, in airplanes, in ships, and so on. And right now, if you look out of the window at the, at the sky, you probably won't see a single airplane for a longer time than you would normally need to see a single airplane. And this is not by chance, this is systematically. So there are fewer planes in the sky, burning fewer, uh, less, uh, less kerosene, needing less oil. The same is true for cars and many other parts of transportation. So there is a reduction in demand for oil. Second, oil is new, needed in the energy sector. And right now many factories are halted, so they don't need as much energy. And um, the, of course the electric energy, energy comes from different sources. Oil is one of them in many countries. So less oil is needed in the energy sector as well. And this is particularly so because when it comes to, to nuclear energy, you cannot simply stop a nuclear plant because it physically doesn't work this way, but you can much easier um, stop uh, an oil-powered um, plant. And then there might also be a drop in demand in the, the petrochemical industry um, because a lot of our chemicals that we use are also um, created from, um, from oil. So there's a steep drop in um, demand for oil in this crisis. Oil producing nations have become um, a cartel sometime, some 50 years ago. They formed the OPEC cartel where they, um, where, where they always decide how much oil do they want to produce in order to keep prices high and stable and keep their profits coming. But long story short, some of these nations, particularly Saudi Arabia and Russia, they were in a fight recently and so they did not reduce the oil production as much as they maybe should have. So the prices are um, plummeting right there. And some of you said, well, isn't a low oil price good for the economy? So why do we have a crisis? And in general, it's true. Um, if... If producers or if anyone has to buy has to pay less for oil it's good for the economy one can say in a general rule of thumb that's the case but only but of course you cannot solve every economic problem with cheap oil particularly if you have a situation where no one really needs oil then cheap oil won't solve the problem and one more kind of fun fact um, that Last week, or this week, we really had a situation where the oil price dropped below zero. So if um, sometime this week you said, well, I'm willing to buy a thousand barrels of oil, deliver it to, deliver it to me in May, 
you would have also gotten some money with um, that oil, but of course you would need um, some capacity to store it, so it's probably not um, the best investment strategy right now. Um, and some of you also wondered why the price of coffee is so high. This doesn't have so much to do with the pandemic. In general, one can say that, that food supplies um, or, or, or food commodities don't, um, don't get as much cheaper as, as industrial commodities because people still drink coffee if they don't build cars. Um, but the, the rise in prices here has something to do with um, too much rain in coffee producing countries. Um, the next slide many of you asked about was this one about capital um, being withdrawn from emerging markets and some said, well, what's the problem there? And this is something that is a little bit complicated and counterintuitive and probably not everyone will get this by hearing it the first time. But once again, be assured it's not a problem for you not to understand this right now because these are things that you probably would better understand in later sessions. Um, so if you think about this longer, it will make more sense, but I don't want to, um, uh, want to duck away from the question. So here's a quick answer. First, you have to ask yourself, how does this capital get to these markets in the first place? Their big part of the answer is that there is a lot of money and a lot of capital right now that doesn't know where it should go. In general, people who have a little money, they buy stuff they want to then eat and drink and so on. People who have more money, put it somewhere where the more money becomes even more money. And right now the opportunities to invest in this way for money to become more money are sparse. And this has some effects. One of these effects, maybe many of you realize, is that prices in real estate go up and rents go up because much capital is um, being driven into the real estate market and called having price effects there. Um, another location where capital goes is what's called emerging economies. And there are many ways in this happen. I just give one um, fictive or fictional example. Let's say there is a mining project in some Latin American country and you have um, a mining company in this country that wants to open a mine because they found, I don't know, copper. And then they need maybe a billion of a billion dollars to to really um, access this copper and build this mine. And they don't have this billion um, in cash laying around there. So what do they do? They say, well, we have the license to dig for copper here and we have the, the know-how how to do it. So we just need some capital to open that mine. And then they will offer bonds and say, well, we offer bonds for uh, $500 million in order to dig our hole here and then we will pay interest on it and then um, we'll have a lot of copper and a lot of money and everybody wins. And so investors, let's say from New York, um, say, well, I have $500 million at hand and I don't know where to put them. So I use them to buy bonds um, from this uh, Latin American mining company. And in the best case scenario, that's um, a win for everyone because the mining company in Latin America can open a mine that they couldn't open otherwise. The investors in New York um, can make profits that they couldn't make otherwise. And uh, workers in the Latin American country have jobs that they wouldn't have otherwise. There might be negative effects on the environment or other kind of negative effects, but not necessarily. So it might be a kind of a good situation for everyone. But then problems might start. Now there's a looming pandemic and now they don't know how will this affect this country where my money is. Will this country still work in half a year or will there be an economic and social breakdown. So I'd rather put my money somewhere safe, um, which is possibly somewhere in the United States or Europe. Also, I'm not that sure whether this is that, that safe right now, but invested investors might think so. So they withdraw the capital from um, this country. The problems go on there because, and 
uh, here it gets more complicated, it's also a question of currencies. For example, it might be that in this American, uh, Latin American country, uh, the currency is some kind of pesos, whatever. And so the mining company, they took their loan in, in pesos. So let's say that $500 million are 5 billion pesos, so they took a loan of 5 billion pesos. This is kind of risky for the investor because you don't know where the, where the currency go, but maybe they were hoping that the, that the, the pesos will appreciate vis-a-vis -vis the dollar, so that maybe in a year from now, the investments will grow by 10% only because of um, currency price fluctuation. However, now they want their money back. So they want their, their 5 billion pesos to be traded back to 500, billion, uh, 500 million dollars. And here now the same effect comes that I explained before about commodity prices. Um, if many people want to sell their pesos for dollars, then the price of pesos will fall, the price of dollars will rise, which means that the, the currency will devaluate. And now, so the peso will devaluate. Now the investors do this as well, and they say, well, I'm invested in such and such billions of pesos, and they're going to devaluate, so I want out even quicker and even more. And so there will be a vicious cycle in which um, disinvestment leads to currency devaluation, and currency devaluation leads to even more disinvestment. And this is already bad for... Um, everyone, but it's probably worse for the country and the, the mining company than it is for the investors. But then it gets, it gets even worse because maybe some other companies in this country or the state themselves, they might also have loans. And many international loans have to be taken in dollars. So now let's say the state has a couple of billion dollars um, of debt, but they have the income from taxes that they collect in pesos. So now the pesos might lose 10, 20, 100, 200% vis-a-vis -vis the dollars. So their taxes are now worthless to repay um, their debt. And so this can be a very vicious cycle and a very vicious situation.